welcome everybody to our uh, event uh, of the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade titled Possible Trajectories of the War in Yemen under the Biden administration. These are very exciting times from many perspectives. Uh, one, perspective, uh, one perspective being that we have a new American government and while it's uh, exact foreign policy strategy in connection with uh, many issues around the world is not yet clear. Nevertheless, um, uh, it's very important to discuss how changes in Washington and in other parts of the world affect uh, wars and other conflicts, not just in the Middle East, but in all over the world. One example which we discussed today will be the war in Yemen. And uh, um, we have two great colleagues who will help us understand what is going on on the ground. We have uh, Farea al-Muslimi, who is the co-founder of the Sana Center uh, for Strategic Studies and as a fellow of the, Chet uh, of the Chetam House. Farah, thank you for accepting our invitation. And we also have Yulia Palik, who is a senior researcher at the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. Thank you very much, Yulia, for being here. Um, I am uh, Mate Sari, I will be the moderator. Uh, from, I am from the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. So the event will be structured uh, on the basis of, of a very interesting discussion. Um, Yulia and Farea will uh, talk for 10 to 15 minutes and then we turn to a Q&A format. Uh, in this Q&A format, uh, I will ask many questions from our participants, but uh, all of the all members of the audience will be able to ask their questions. Please use the Q&A function of Zoom or alternatively the chat function, uh, and I will um, uh, read out loud your questions and uh, post them to our participants. If you are watching this event on Facebook, I will try to check the Facebook uh, comment section as well. So if you have some questions there, I will try to uh, bring it to the, uh, to the agenda. So without any further ado, Yulia, I would like to ask you to first talk about the humanitarian perspectives of the war, the changes and the, the, the different perceptions, uh, the, the different aspects of reconstruction. Mm, thank you very much for the opportunity to join this conversation. I am very happy to be in one panel with Farah, so I'm pretty sure that it's going to be an interesting discussion. So today I'm going to briefly talk about so-called supply and demand side challenges associated with foreign aid in Yemen and how the U.S. administration can foster better, more sustainable, locally rooted mechanisms that would be crucial in the post-conflict era. Because although so the title of the event is uh, the potential pathways of the war in Yemen. Uh, I really do think that it is crucial to start talking about reconstruction in an eventual post-war scenario. So reconstruction and recovery is a pertinent question. Uh, and um, a latest World Bank rapid assessment program suggests that the current recovery needs of Yemen are uh, somewhere between 20 to 25 billion US dollars over five years. And the same assessment has also concluded that the most damage uh, has essentially was uh, has essentially uh, caused by uh, the bombings and uh, got into the housing sector. But also when it comes to different governorates, there are substantial differences uh, in the damage. And Sada governorate, the original stronghold of the Houthis has suffered the most damage. Uh, now the question is that who is going to finance with this 20 to 25 billion US dollars, which is most likely going to increase and with what consequences? And I wanna raise two aspects here, uh, something that I term as supply side and demand side challenges that are related to Yemen. So under supply side challenges, uh, I refer to donor policies, uh, which are related to both development and humanitarian aid. Um, the first issue here would be the issue of quantity, as we have seen throughout uh, the entire conflict that humanitarian aid pledges fluctuate 
quite abhorrently. Uh, and in the last round of uh, the UN donor conference, it was a huge underfunding. Yemen also hasn't been a major recipient of development aid throughout time. So this is something to keep in mind, the mere quantity. And there is the connected second issue of time with this, because pledges and actual aid disbursement are quite uh, different things. Uh, and many months can pass between the two. So uh, even if pledges are made, the conflict is still going on and it's not waiting for the actual aid to arrive, right? Um, the third point in the supply side uh, problem uh, or challenge uh, consists of the quality of aid uh, because um, historically, and especially from a US perspective, the US focused most of its development aid uh, not on strengthening governance structures, which are and would be rooted in local structures, but to finance counterterrorism. And they have always been viewed Yemen through a security lens. And uh, Farah can talk a lot about this. Um, and this has always, this has often happened uh, at the expense of other sectors. Uh, and the four and last point concerning the supply side uh, challenges is, re uh, is related to the donors itself, because going back to the first question, if history is any guide, it is most likely that Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE are going to be the primary uh, financing agents of this 20 to 25 billion dollars. Yet these two countries alongside others uh, are one of the main perpetrators uh, of the current destruction. So this involves a lot of accountability problems uh, and also the neutrality uh, of aid uh, is uh, quite heavily questioned. Uh, and in fact, so the reconstruction efforts have already uh, began and traditionally it has mostly focused on large infrastructure projects, um, which is the same now and it is mostly directed uh, through the so-called Saudi Reconstruction and Development Program in Yemen. Um, and uh, most of this aid is going to government controlled areas. Uh, and as I've said early on, uh, the most the area that is in most need of reconstruction would be the Houthi controlled areas. And there has been many studies concerning the actual aid or underlying motifs of this aid, whether it is aimed at securing uh, economic gains and also uh, the construction of this alternative oil pipeline through Makra Governorate to the Arabian Sea uh, is another question, which essentially questions the motives behind the provision of this aid. So uh, not to uh, lose sight of the time, I will move on now to demand side problems concerning humanitarian and development aid, which are rooted uh, in the Yemeni straight state structure and its fragmentation throughout the conflict. Uh, historically, Yemen has quite a low uh, level of absorption capacity for receiving aid. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have the uh, adequate institutional background, which would enable any government to receive, manage, and to monitor aid. So this makes uh, aid delivery very much problematic. And uh, there are very little efforts now uh, to construct any type of ministry that would be able to do so. The local Yemeni organization development uh, champions and also the SANA Center have provided excellent insights and recommendations into how to solve this and then reviewed past uh, reconstruction programs and lessons learned. So I highly suggest it to everyone that is interested in this topic to have a look at these. Um, and the second issue with, the, with these demand side problems that would be important for the US to take into account because it happened with military aid too is that the um, uh, ex-government uh, led by President Saleh have uh, traditionally and quite often misused development aid and redirected to fight domestic opposition forces. Uh, this is also um, kind of a natural consequence of the systematic corruption that has been uh, presented in central Yemen. And uh, third, uh, and most importantly, uh, because this is the most current sphere, aid and especially humanitarian aid now has been uh, quite heavily contributing to the war economy in Yemen uh, and became weaponized uh, by all the parties, uh, which, is which makes it very difficult for aid organizations to work, but also for donors to actually commit because they are aware of the misuse. 
So these were the two signs, and I'm going I'm going to finish it uh, almost immediately, uh, just by suggesting that the U.S., based on these two broad factors, can essentially contribute throughout the war uh, to develop these institutions that would be uh, locally driven, independent, uh, and not ad hoc, that would be able to minister aid. And it would also, uh, and it is also advised to the Biden administration, which would be essentially in line with its promise to reconnect to international organizations, uh, to lessen Yemen's dependence, aid dependence on GCC states because of the close interconnection between economic aid and political influence. So future US initiatives should and can help to create such reconstruction uh, institutions in Yemen. And I finish here, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. Before I give the floor to Faria, let me have a follow-up question. So do you see any actual fluctuations or strategic differences between the approach of various American administrations when it comes to humanitarian and reconstruction funds and policy uh, regarding, uh, uh, regarding Yemen? Mm, so the, the latest uh, and most visible example of this was that during the Trump administration, US aid essentially cut its aid to the Houthi controlled areas uh, because of uh, the concerns of the misuse uh, of aid uh, and the weaponization of aid. Uh, and that was a huge loss for those territories. And now the Biden administration reopened this. Now this can be interpreted in multiple ways. Uh, and uh, it is essentially the question of whether the aid is actually uh, getting to the recipients or not. And this is usually quite questionable in case of Yemen. Uh, there has been indications from the Biden administration and especially from Anthony Blinken that they are going to increase humanitarian aid, but not much uh, talk has been about development aid as of yet. Thank you very much, Julia. I'm sure that the members of the audience and myself included uh, will have many questions uh, in the Q&A section. So now I would like to give the floor to Farah. Uh, please help us understand what role does the US play in the Yemeni conflict? Uh, and what are your expectations and the expectations of local actors regarding the Biden administration? Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Julia, and to the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, great to be with you. Um, let me probably say four things about the U.S. role in the region overall in the Middle East, not just in Yemen, over the last 10 years. First of all, I think the perception, big part of the United States influence in the region was about the perception or because of the perception of the U.S. in the region and its role. And the self-perception, even if the U.S. has, let's just say, went very low the last five years with the presence of an administration like Donald Trump. That big perception on America, by America, has, I think, in many ways decreased in the region. Yes, the US still have a troops in the region. It still the, has a P5 and all of that. But the idea of America being you know, a, a tribe, again, the last five years, I think, have influenced um, its ability to be a world player overall, including in Yemen. That's number one. Number two is <clears throat> one of the biggest mistakes of the United States is its foreign policy has also been highly affected or shaped by domestic policy. You have an administration, usually a party or the other, who wants to take a decision for election reasons, and that usually have impact on other world, like on Yemen. An example of this is when you had the, from a Yemen point of view, there isn't much a difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. They actually both have been to a different point problematic as an administration. In 2011, you had a, an a, a Obama backed also deal that was in Yemen. It was a clumsy deal because it did not ensure accountability. And then after that, it was actually the Democrats who allowed the Saudi Arabia to go into a war in Yemen. It wasn't actually the Republicans that also affected the way how it thinks or how it worked in, 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 in Yemen as a country. And there came after that Don, uh, uh, Donald Trump, who was obsessed with overruling anything that Obama did. And that included also anything good or bad he did on Yemen. This is how we always ultimately end up paying the price for domestic US uh, 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 issues. Let me give an example of that, is when the United States designated the Houthis as a terrorist uh, organization, FTO. 
obviously anyone with a centimeter of a brain thinks that this is a problematic, this will backfire, it will only actually help the Houthis. What happens is immediately after Biden, and that was a problematic, obviously, a decision by the Trump. What happened when Biden came to power is he immediately removed the Houthis without any conditions. And that was equally problematic because in fact, first you lost the leverage that you had on the Houthis, but then it also sent the very wrong message domestically and regionally and nationally. But again, Biden was just obsessed with overruling what, what Trump did. This kind of an internal struggle in DC that's reflecting itself, let's say, in Marib and Sa'da in a different way has been a fundamental part of uh, United States of America when it comes to policies, especially Yemen. And finally, as uh, Yulia was saying earlier, I think the problem with the US is it doesn't have a good or a bad policy toward Yemen. It has no policy on Yemen. And that's much, no policy in many ways is much worse than actually a bad policy. What that means is the United States of America always had um, a Saudi policy, Iran policy, oil policy, Al-Qaeda policy, counterterrorism policy, and whatever Yemen fit came under that, came under one or more of these variables in its thinking. There was again, and there remains in my opinion, no Yemen policy. And finally, with, with an example of that is right now, is uh, 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 what the US appointed is a special envoy to Yemen, which is important also because it sends an important signals into the region. But in fact, should the United States wants to be involved in Yemen positively in any way, it needs to go to UN Security Council, adopt a new resolution on Yemen, and have a new framework for negotiation not actually going to Riyadh or Tehran or to Sana'a. That's where things actually would begin should the United States wants to play a more uh, of a positive role when it comes to Yemen. The problem is how do you strike the right balance between having, because the United States, like the United Kingdom, like most of European countries, are a war sides in Yemen. They are not neutral and they are not clean and they are part of this war in a way or another, in a, to a degree or another. So how do you strike the engagement of these big powerful countries, but also not take the conversation and the engagement to be about them? Because beyond, before America being about the Congress and the Senate and the First Amendment, America is also about armed companies. And how do you strike these balances of engaging American interest in the region, not just on Yemen, <clears throat> while keeping the domestic parts of priorities of agendas from Yemenis and from different sites in the region over you know the years that has and where to come. I think that will be one of the main challenges is, is how do you find the framework where the US has a buy-in, the UK has a buy-in, but it's also a UN framework, framework that responds to Yemenis issues more than the current set of diplomatic frameworks, whether on Yemen or in Syria or in other parts. Over, I guess, to you, and then I can take any question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will have a follow-up question to you as well. So basically, uh, our event focuses on the expectations regarding by the Biden administration. But let me ask you, what is going on the on the ground currently? So there is a battle going on in Marib. How do you see the current dynamics taking place on the ground between the Houthis, uh, the government forces? Uh, and other actors of the war. The Battle of Marib is the current biggest battle, uh, I think since probably five or six years in Yemen. It's a bloody uh, a battle in both ends. Um, if Marib falls into the hands of the Houthis, I think we are at least five years far from peace. And it will be extremely difficult if we are lucky. And it will be extremely difficult to dial back the Houthis on anything should they take over Marib. This will also in the long term fragmentize Yemen further because you will have the Houthis in control of the north and more or less the south of the transitional council in a charge of the south, which will institutionalize the fragmentation and the split if you, or the splits of Yemen for the long term. That's the biggest battle. Currently what's happening, I think the last two years is military advance. The war in Yemen continued to happen. Saudis continue to pour money. Iranians continue to send weapons and support and money all of them at the same time, but not enough or not uh, uh, into a decisive factor from a military point of view. So it just kept the war going. And that's what we are have seeing in Yemen right now is a front line that's in Marib that has been more or less active for the last four years 
with you know you 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 advance four or five meters, but the main lines of these front lines remains the same for the past five uh, probably four years so far. Thank you. Uh, so while we are waiting for questions from the audience, uh, let me ask a few questions uh, of my own uh, viewpoint. So basically what we can we can see very few things very concrete uh ten, very few tangible things from the Biden administration so far from regarding yemen but we can see clearly that the gcpoa negotiations taking place in vienna are of crucial importance how do you see both farah and julia how do you see the effects of this negotiation process on the yemeni war will the biden administration use the yemeni war as a bargaining chip to appease iran somehow uh, or the relationship is more complex than that. I can start to follow this pattern that once Farah wants me. Um, so I think uh, uh, this is although a very interesting question, and I think this concerns many international commentators' interest. I would say personally, this is a danger of framing this issue again in a sense that then Yemen is going to be the hostage of any type of other issue as of now, the Iranian nuclear deal. So again, Yemen is embedded in either in counterterrorism, Saudi Arabia, Gulf or Iran. And this will again lead to the same consequences that it will be used by one party as a bargaining chip. So I think one of the first points would be to consider Yemen in itself as an independent file and have a Yemen policy as Faria suggested. Uh, but to answer the question, uh, I do not think that Yemen features so heavily in these negotiations. I think there are more important high level uh, things that people there are discussing, to be fair. This can be a side discussion for sure. Uh, and. Iranian influence, would Iranians be able to uh, stop the Houthis advance in Marib, for example, or anything they have done? I'm not sure about that. Uh, so this is also a question of what is the real leverage of Iran uh, over the Houthis, uh, which is, although better known than in the early years of the war, still very much debated. But my bottom line would be, uh, and I would happy to hear uh, other opinions that, Framing again Yemen as a bargaining chip in the Iranian nuclear negotiations will lead to the same outcomes that if any type of outcome in Yemen will be satisfied because of larger issues. Um, just to add into that, <clears throat> I think you're right. So in 2015, we had a Yemen war kind of the price of the Iran deal, where the Americans, you know, told the Gulf, let this happen, and then you know we will close eyes while you go bomb Yemen, and in fact, help here and there. And that was a problem. There is always a chance that you can leverage something over something. But as Julia was saying, the dots are so scattered when it comes to the negotiation framework of the Yemen. Iran five years ago was much weaker, less and uh, 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 much weaker in Yemen than it is actually today. And that's the irony of the Saudi intervention is actually it has empowered Iran in Yemen rather than impacted it. You can also see for the first time the last two years, Iran engagement on Yemen has been very active. We know for sure that the Houthis didn't have drones five years ago. Iran would, for the first time, also publicly violated international resolution and handed the embassy in Tehran to the Houthis over the last two years. That didn't happen at the first uh, uh, part of the wars. What does this tell us? It tells us also that Iran is trying highly to leverage what was already very little leverage it has on the Houthis, and also a card that it invested very little. This card is becoming now more and more important in that sense. But, and I think, you know, obviously Marib and Ben are very different cities, but they will have some sort of aspect of Yemen's, um, of, of, the, of, uh, of the region and Yemen's future at the same time, a conversation on Yemen, to my knowledge, uh, uh, happened mostly in Iraq talks rather than in Bayanna talks, which is between the Iranians and the Saudis. And that makes more sense in that regard because the GCOB is huge and big. It should be leveraged over Iran if there is a deal to condition it, obviously, to good uh, regional behavior. 
But so far, at least to my info, as Julia was saying, that hasn't been really the case in the conversation. Over. Thank you. Uh, remaining on the global level for one more second. Basically, uh, Farah mentioned that the UN could play a bigger role uh, in this whole um, uh, situation. What do you think? What is the leverage of the Security Council? Do you see the members of the Security Council uh, acting up and what is uh, needed to bring us closer to the resolution of the war? Sorry, Mate, it's also very helpful if you're saying our name so then we don't look at each other, <laughs> embarrass them, being very yeah. polite that who's going to answer. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my viewpoint on uh, the UN engagement uh, is also, again, quite pessimistic and critical given the so far three special envoys who unfortunately had quite little effect or leverage over the parties, which is, of course, a symptom of what's happening in the UN Security Council. One thing that the Biden administration can do is to push uh, for changing the current UN Security Council resolution that uh, essentially drives the conversation, which is resolution 2216, uh, which was uh, signed in 2015. Now things have fundamentally changed since then. It requires the Houthis that resolution to disarm, to withdraw from the territories and to reestablish the Hadi government. Um, this, um, the last part has been once questioned during 2016 in the Kuwait negotiations, but then Hadi was essentially out of fear of being politically sidelined, uh, didn't actually proceed with that, uh, with that uh, process. But what I think uh, would be a very important first step is to have an updated resolution. Now, because of the inner workings of the UN Security Council, what Russia or what China will do uh, in an eventual um, voting on that resolution is highly questionable. And I also don't want to spare the attention on the fact that the UN Security Council members are although key actors in peacemaking as well as in Yemen, but at the same time, these actors account for two thirds of all weapon exports in the world. And uh, this is something that we tend to forget and always fixate ourselves on the peacemaking efforts. But there is vested interest in UN Security Council members in the continuation of wars, even if it's not the governments who are essentially sitting in UN chairs, as Faria said, the army complex and the military complex in these countries do feature in, although uh, not in an observ observable way. Over to you, thank you. Yes, as Julia was saying, I, I think 100% is the, the question or the answer starts is to have a new resolution a resolution that does not normalize with, take, with taking power by force, the Houthis, but also that doesn't end up being a pass like 2216 to Hadi to stay in Riyadh and do whatever he wants for the next 20 years, which is the current framework. That fundamental, where you keep the soul of 2216, but you update it and you don't end up making it a ticket for anyone to do what they want, that will be the first uh, beginning into it. And relatively, the council, the UN Security Council relatively is unified on Yemen compared to, let's say, in Syria or in other fights. The problem is it's terribly unified. You know, it's unified to do bad things on Yemen, to let war happen, to uh, uh, let, uh, you know, give a pass to the Gulf, to negotiate with Iran. That's the problem. We, we have the first problem. We don't, is solved. We don't have a fragmented UN Security Council resolution. We just need the other part, which is for it to be good to start thinking with. That would be the first framework because the current framework of negotiation is impossible to negotiate with whether you are, or to negotiate, whether you are <clears throat> the mediator is, you know, Martin Griffith or Jesus Christ. You really cannot, this is a, a pretty deadlocked uh, framework you have. That would be one part. The second thing I wanna add when it comes to the council is we always hear the line that there is no military solution in Yemen. And uh, that, I, I, you know, I can't agree uh, more with that statement. It's pretty accurate and it's important. What I think it is also missing is there is also no UN solution in Yemen. 
alone. There is no military solution and there is no UN solution anymore. The UN as an organization, as a framework, since it was founded 50 years ago, was founded to solve a very different conflicts from what our part of the world, at least at the moment, is have. I am not interested, sure, 100% that it can actually do this job alone. How do you keep the UN engaged? Because that's a framework, the only framework you can actually some sort of keep accountable, but also to not let it hinder, because we are having a serious problem, not just with the UN, but all international multilateralism and the frameworks are really facing a fundamental relevance issue. How do you use the powers of the UN, but also not be hindered by these problems it is facing overall is also another challenge we need to think of. Over. Thank you. So let's move on to the regional level. Uh, the Yemeni conflict is many times described as a Saudi-Iranian proxy war. It's a big question mark for me whether this is a, a proper description, but if it is, then uh, the good news is that recently we, there were many rumors and actual news um, coming from Iraq, from Syria and other places in the Middle East, which show that there is um, a, a process of, of, uh, of negotiation taking place between Iran and Saudi Arabia. There was recently a, even a Saudi um, delegation in Damascus, at least to some news resources. Do you see any uh, effect of this diplomatic process between Saudi Arabia and Iran on the developments of uh, Yemen. Let's start with Farah this time. These are powerful, rich and undemocratic countries. So the more they are in a problem with each other, the higher we weak and poor states pay the price for that. It's definitely good news if we find some way where they you know, keep existing with each other without putting the house on fire. That definitely and only can be positive impact on Yemen. I and I think what's more important than happening with the Iran Saudi conversation is the Gulf Gulf conversations, uh, the Saudi Qatari and between the Gulf themselves. That has highly impacted the war in Yemen and the region. In fact, in many ways, more than the the Iranian Saudi struggle. Big part of the conflicts we are facing in the region. Obviously, we have civil wars. We have a problematic international frameworks of mediations. We have big oil and uh, security contractors in Western companies. But we also have something that have thrived since 2011, and it's the proxy wars. And in a lot of ways, the proxy wars are more destructive than even direct wars. It breaks the way how we even fight internally. It brings in internal, uh, external actors. and it, they bear no responsibility just because they are not directly there. And part of the Yemen proxy wars used started Saudi Iranian. It ended up later on uh, Saudi Qatari versus um, yeah, Saudi UAE versus Qatar and others. And recently it's even becoming more and more Qatar era, uh, uh, UAE. And either way, this club of monarchies in the regions that have no uh, 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 parliaments that have no auditors, that have no sort of accountability, are fighting wars in other countries. And that always has been an issue, and that will remain an issue until we unblock that regional uh, involvement destructive in the region. An internal Gulf conversation, I think, will have even more positive impact on Yemen war than an Iran-Saudi uh, conversation. And that's a good start uh, that we have seen the last few months, and I think um, that, that, that will be an important. Over to you, Yulia. Hmm. I think um, the proxy war framework, which has been uh, so consistently applied to Yemen uh, and uh, also to many other conflicts uh, since that since erupted the that erupted since the Arab Spring, is an interesting. Although I'm not necessarily sure that how useful it is for any type of solution. Um, what I what I think from a regional perspective is very important to emphasize is that the empowerment or the financing of proxies will always be 
a very attractive solution for uh, for regional powers. Why? Because you save lives and costs mostly. But then what effect it has and how many different effects it has on the ground is also different. And once locals learn that, okay, they can be used and paid for, they will be incentivized to present a conflict as to invite external actors to finance them. So there is another way around too that how the proxies influence their supporters in general. Um, and back to the Iranian Saudi conversations, I, uh, I fully agree that uh, obviously any type of more cordial relationship between the two countries is just beneficial uh, for the region. What I think uh, is also very encouraging is that in the past two years, basically, there has been backdoor consultations, mostly in Oman, between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I think this track holds much promise, sometimes much more than the UN one. Uh, and there has been positive outcomes of that, a larger scale prisoner exchange, more cordial uh, messages, and a lot of things that we are not aware of and are happening behind the scenes. Uh, and I think this also just shows uh, that whether the Houthis participation in these Saudi Houthi talks are happening with the blessing of Iran or not, is kind of irrelevant. Uh, and uh, this regional confrontation uh, between Saudi Arabia and Iran is unlikely to escalate into a direct war between these two states because that would be immeasurably costly. So it will always be essentially a very attractive thing for them, as I said, to fund these proxies if they can agree on something when there wouldn't be any need to fund these proxies. Uh, then that's great. Uh, but again, I view uh, the direct talks between, uh, although behind closed doors, between the Saudis and the Houthis, a more promising and uh, essentially important aspect of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we received a couple of questions, but before I ask them, let me go back to something for uh, said regarding the effects of intra-GCC dynamics on uh, Yemen. So it's very easy to see the Saudi narrative, the Iranian narrative in Yemen and the, the strategies of the two bigger powers in the region. But what is the, uh, how can we conceptualize the Qatari or the Emirati strategy in Yemen, their participation, what are their aims and how does their conflict basically affect developments on the ground in Yemen? Maybe we can start with Yulia this time. And uh, you also mentioned the politicization of aid in this regard, especially the, the that's coming from Gulf states. How th does that question fit into this larger narrative? Mm. So uh, I'm sure that Fara will be able to say much more concrete things about these uh, intra GCC talks. What I think is a particularly interesting aspect is that before the war, for basically since the establishment of the GCC, uh, it has been a conversation whether Yemen will ever be admitted to this club or not. Uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, why? Because of the political system of Yemen in the first place. And secondly, uh, and similarly importantly, because of the lack of any type of economic contribution that the country can make. But a unified GCC, if that would ever happen, would be a particularly useful framework uh, to, uh, to rebuild and reestablish Yemen, uh, and also to provide it um, kind of an out, kind of a, a safe haven from other external forces that would, uh, that would try to influence the conflict. I think one of the most interesting issues uh, two years ago uh, was the, uh, in, in terms of the interest GCC issues was the UAE Saudi fragmentation uh, and especially the Southern Transitional Council, uh, which is uh, a UAE established uh, organization in Yemen, uh, which in part in uh, parts of um, <clears throat> 2018 and 19 uh, has been fighting the Hadi government. This was depicted as being revealing huge cracks in between uh, the Saudi-led coalition. But we have to recognize that the Saudis and the UAs, although geographically um, in different ways, but they will and they are cooperating in Yemen and they are aware of each other's actions. 
And also the UAE, although said that they are uh, withdrawing their forces, we uh, shouldn't forget that there are 200,000 fighters who are on UAE payroll. Uh, now, most recently, the Qatari um, Saudi talks uh, have been very important because the rift between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, in part because of Iran, uh, had huge impacts uh, in the uh, local dynamics of the Yemeni conflict. A unified GCC uh, is better. Uh, than a disunified, because a disunified one will lead to, uh, as we have seen throughout the past five years, even more fragmentations uh, in the Yemeni conflict and elsewhere too. Thank you. Farel? Yes, very quickly, I guess, uh, 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 when it comes to Saudi Arabia, right now their main enemies in Yemen is the Houthis. UAE main enemy in Yemen is the Muslim Brotherhood. Let's start from there to see the fundamental approaches. Um, there is a very fundamental, few fundamental differences between how UAE looks to Yemen and how Saudi looks to Yemen. Uh, first, Saudi Arabia has huge borders with Yemen, 1,500 kilometers. UAE has none. So it does, it makes the math very different in both countries. There is a huge, second point is there is a, an absolute bromance between MBS and MBZ. But at the same time, their bureaucracies are in a war with each other. They don't get each other. They don't understand each other. Saudi Arabia is a huge country with a huge bureaucracy and many processes and many Saudis. You know, there is this Saudi and there is that Saudi as a country when it comes to Yemen or the region overall. But UAE, the number of people who take decisions on Yemen are nine to 10 maximum sometimes, you know. So the, the math, the way, the approaches, the bureaucracies, the geography are all things adding up into a different, and obviously who is an enemy and who is a friend in Yemen, adding into a different directions from what UAE and Saudi Arabia think. These are the major two players at the moment when it comes to that. When you move ahead, you look into a country like Qatar. Qatar's policy the last seven or five years in Yemen was to do anything that would give Saudi Arabia a headache. Um, and that was obviously very cheap in a country and very easy also. Uh, for That was their entire plan, almost like the Russia and the West. We will interrupt and disturb everything they do, whether it's good or bad, doesn't really matter. It's just we will be a headache there um, for them. And that was Qatar's fundamental role in the past. And it had, and Qatar, for example, had the relationship very interesting. It was with the Houthis, but also with the most part of the Muslim Brotherhood, Islah, in fact when it fled, spill it away from Saudi Arabia in 2017 after the internal Qatar crisis. Now that has been changing. Qatar's policy, even in media, it gave all of its proxy TV channels uh, and orders to uh, 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 stop attacking Saudi Arabia, but keep it on UAE for a while. That's, I think, will be the next proxy war, is between Qatar, Saudi in one side, and UAE, Egypt, on one side. You might have Turkey join the first side, and sometimes Bahrain or other countries will join the other side, but that's the next proxy war I, in fact, see in Yemen. What is a country like Oman doing? Oman is going through a fundamental change of, uh, because of the new leadership in Oman. Um, last year, they replaced the Minister of Foreign Affairs, which I find more important than even the passing of the Sultan because that minister, or specific minister of foreign affairs made the entire Oman de you know, of decades of policy of surviving all of this war was very different. Few years ago, Oman, because of what Saudi, how active it was in Mahra, moved immediately from being a silent mediator, someone into actively engaged in Yemen war. It funded, armed, and in a lot of ways supported the uprisings in Mahra against Saudi Arabia. Because Al Mahra for, for, for Oman is a domestic issue. It's not even a Yemeni neighboring issue. And having Saudi Arabia started to meddle there made Oman join the Me Too club. You know, I'm also being annoyed by Saudi Arabia and UAE. That obviously took it into a different direction. Now you have a new Sultan who's very aware of Corona and what it did economically to his country and what it can do. So he's trying to totally reshape the dynamics with Saudi Arabia. We saw the last few weeks an interesting 
conversation happening between both countries. There is, a, I think, a new summit happening soon. We will see that, I think, changing, and that also is very good. When you think of countries like Kuwait, it's just waiting for the, you know, the boys to finish the fight so that it can start help cleaning. That country, while it could not afford not being theoretically part of the Arab coalition to bomb Yemen, theoretically, it still is one of those countries from what it suffered itself in 1990, wanting to avoid as much worse as it actually um, can be in the region. And I think the Kuwaitis, more than any other Gulf country, probably are willing to play an active role like they did in the past on Yemen's negotiations. But like everyone in the region, they won't move to do anything until they have not just one, but two green lights from Saudi Arabia one from the older institutions and one from the young institutions in that case. And they are very hesitant to do anything until that happens. Should there be tomorrow uh, an economy, a development and post-war Yemen, as Yulia was saying, I think that's when we will start seeing a country like um, Kuwait uh, playing more of a, a role on Yemen's fire. Over. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm turning to the questions of the audience. And I will pick some of them uh, just to, you know, abuse my authority as a moderator. So there is one question about the role of the EU, which is something I also wanted to ask. So how do you see the role of the European Union in the Yemeni war, um, especially from the human humanitarian perspective? Uh, Yulia, can we start with you? Mm, I think, um, and I'm happy that the EU as a topic uh, is essentially uh, raised in this conversation. Um, I would rather say that in my personal experience, there are a few European countries that are active in Yemen and have a good knowledge of Yemen, obviously because of the colonial ties, these are the British, although not part of the EU anymore. Um, but uh, the British have always been a very important actor, especially in South Yemen. Um, and in terms of humanitarian funding, the Swedish, Dutch, Norwegian and German states has always have always been very important actor. They have played lesser of a role since 2014. We have to remind ourselves that the National Dialogue Conference in Yemen in 2014 was very heavily promoted and uh, supported by the EU on essentially on an on an organizational level. Uh, the reason why I think on the EU level we do not hear much about Yemen uh, is that partly because the EU is just very busy with its uh, own issues, especially concerning now um, the COVID crisis. But then secondly is <clears throat> The EU has paid, if we are um, comparing uh, much more attention to the Syrian crisis or to Afghanistan. And the very simple reason for that is that we, as, a, as the EU experienced huge inflows uh, of refugees and migrants throughout the years to various EU countries, which essentially made us trained on uh, these uh, few European countries, uh, domestic institutions and uh, on the welfare uh, state scheme. So they had an economic incentive or buy-in, let's put it like this, to try to find some type of uh, solution or to contribute to some type of uh, resolution in these countries. Uh, Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, from Yemen, there is considerably less um, refugees uh, in the EU. Part of the reason is that uh, Yemenis are mostly displaced internally, so they are IDPs. And uh, the current fighting in uh, Madrid is also uh, very important because of this aspect, since Madrid was the biggest uh, IDP population within Yemen. Uh, and if the Houthis go there, these people will be forced again uh, to leave. Um, and then what the EU can do uh, and what the EU does, uh, it has a Yemen file and it has a Yemen policy and it has a dedicated office that is working on Yemen. Uh, to my knowledge, the EU has been uh, quite prominent in funding local or track two initiatives when it comes to mediation, but it's much more quiet on the international scene. Whether it's good or not, it certainly doesn't hurt uh, that it contributes, again, mostly through German and Dutch funds uh, to various uh, track two initiatives. Thank you and over to Fadeh. 
Yes, as just to echo what you were saying, Yulia, I think one of the biggest problems of EU decision makers and overall democracies is it's very election driven. That means is if there is a refugee in your election place, then it becomes an issue for you. Then you think about it as a policy maker. That happened with the Syrian crisis. You have much more engaged Europe because there are refugees. Um, in Yemen, because as you said, you know, we are domestically, but because also the country and the, mo the mobility from and to the country has been close to impossible, it made it very difficult for Yemenis to show up in Greece and in Hungary and to provoke the right and the left wing in your domestic national issues there. Um, and this is a fundamental sin of democracies. Again, uh, they, they go into strategic and national issues from an election point of view whether it, you know, it's an annoying thing, whether it's in your platform or no. And Yemen haven't sent the refugees. I think that also, that, as you said, that drives a lot the EU shameful silence when it comes to Yemen as a country um, on that regard. The second one is, um, at least until Brexit happened, the EU was uh, uh, somehow leaving the lead for the UK, which was not leading an EU agenda on Yemen. The UK is a pin holder at the UN Security Council, and the UK is a war holder. It's not a pin holder or a file holder in that regards in Yemen. Now, you know, maybe after Brexit, Europe will start thinking differently. I hope that will happen, but that will take some time until we see fundamental change in it. What we have seen over the last five years is the EU uh, uh, almost moved less to act as a political entity and more like an aid entity. It has a sponsored and co-hosted, probably I think minus one, all the aid pledges conference in different places of Switzerland, um, in Stockholm. Um, there is a, that, that conversation has been happening, but it's all about, it adds into the larger uh, image that Europe is a payer rather than a player. Um, when it comes to these politics. It still hosts these conferences, but when it comes to ad adopting a new UN resolution, adopting this, whether as countries or as entity, it has been, as you said, Yulia, very shy. Over to you, Mazi. Thank you. Uh, we received a question about the Houthi movement. So do you see the Houthi movement as a unified actor? And does it uh, make sense for Saudis and the central government to engage in a negotiation process with the Houthi movement? And how can it be assured that if the leadership or one segment of the leadership of the Houthi movement will agree to something that, that it will be actually have an effect on the ground? And to this question, I would add another question, uh, which is basically the same question, but not regarding the Houthi movement, regarding all actors in Yemen. So how, uh, strong is the grasp of the on the of the central government on local militias, local fighters, and so on. Farah, maybe we can start with you this time. I leave the militias part for Yulia, but um, <laughs> I, I think um, <clears throat> as long as there is a war, the Houthis will not just remain unified, but they will actually increase their grip and their unity and command control. Um, I think the war have kind of give the Houthis a pass from a lot of things, from ruling, from governance, but also from their deep internal divisions and conversations as a militia. I don't see that changing again as long as the war continues. Maybe in a few years, if the war doesn't, that will be a different scale. It is ultimately a militia. It thrives over the idea of an enemy, no matter who that enemy is, even if it's a 29 million Yemenis. As long as this exists, then we are going to have a more unified group than we think. At the same time, what we have seen is, a, obviously the war in Yemen is going worse for everyone, the Saudis, the government, most importantly, the Yemenis, but it is also even going bad for the Houthis in some regard, because what I am noticing is uh, uh, the Houthis, more and more, they are also losing their touch with the reality or their commitment to Yemen for the sake of their commitment with Tehran and with Iran. Right now, you definitely have two groups within the Houthis, those who report to Sa'da, to Abdul Malik al-Houthi, and those who report to Tehran, to Khomeini. And because the essentiality of relationship with Iran only increased the last five years, the second part of it only gained more power and only actually had more relevance. 
And I think this is the problem. That's why I personally, politically or economically, I don't believe in sanctions. And I think that they actually backfire. When everyone, including Europe, the West, withdrew from Sana'a, can you believe who are the two actors they left in Sana'a? The Iranians and the Russians. That was the only two embassies that left in Sana'a for five years. The one who was feeding European diplomats information and the briefing from Sana'a are the Russians, believe it or not, actually. Um, so when everyone walked out of the Houthis and when everyone cut their relationship with Tehran and with the Houthis, I believe that only empowered the Houthi Iranian essentiality because you want to talk to someone, but you're left only with someone there. And there was no more to influence that behavior as we moved on. I think that is something definitely have gone even deeper the last uh, few years. Yulia, over to you. Uh, so I think these are uh, endless questions and it's uh, super interesting, obviously, and one of the things that uh, interests me the most in case of Yemen is uh, what is going to be the future power sharing deal uh, in Yemen. And this essentially concerns these questions that has been asked whether it makes sense to negotiate with the Houthis. Of course it does, uh, because they cannot be disregarded uh, from Yemen or what they have done and how much territory they have occupied. We also shouldn't forget that uh, based on the pre-existing uh, Saleh system, the Houthis essentially first in close cooperation with um, um, former members of the General People's Congress, established a parallel uh, state institution and put their own loyalists uh, there on top of these. Uh, we also shouldn't forget that their, um, uh, their essential governing system uh, doesn't rest as much on service provision as it is the case, for example, with Hezbollah in Lebanon, but on repression. What does it mean for people living under Houthi control? How will anyone uh, and when will uh, introduce any type of transitional justice matters? Uh, how will the Houthis be accountable? Who wants essentially the Houthis to govern uh, when they have been repressed for years? Yet the Houthis obviously cannot be disregarded. Are you going to disarm the Houthis? This is very unlikely to happen in a country uh, like Yemen, that any actors would be disarmed. I, I fundamentally disbelieve in this, especially then the latter parts of reintegration, because reintegration to where, with what kind of economic incentives. Uh, how fragmented the Houthi movement inside is, I uh, think that it places a lot of attention and effort uh, in concealing any type of inner fragmentation uh, from public eyes, so it doesn't become uh, obvious. Uh, there are studies which essentially talk about what Faria was describing, um, about uh, the inner workings and the problems within uh, the Houthi leadership and uh, potential disagreements. Do they translate to any type of incoherence on the field? I do not think so, uh, because the repression of the population uh, is essentially uniform across territories held by the Houthis. But I think it's a fundamentally interesting question, both if we are talking about the US, if, we're, if it's just the three of us who are talking, or you talk to anyone that, what is going to happen to the Houthis politically? Because they are a militia, but they have learned a specific form of governance now throughout the five years, but they've learned governance under war conditions. How is that going to be when there isn't any war? Uh, are they going to be integrated into a unified Yemen? Um, I think these are questions that would deserve way more attention than, uh, than it is as of now. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for the maybe two questions. Uh, the next question has partly been answered by Yulia in the first uh, in, in in her first contribution, but uh, let me rephrase it a little. So um, every now and then, the attention of the international community uh, pops up regarding Yemen, for example, especially when it comes to the humanitarian crisis. And then for weeks, it's in the international media that uh, the Yemeni crisis is one of the most severe humanitarian crises of the last uh, half a century, basically. Uh, how do you see the current patterns changing, the humanitarian aid patterns changing in the last year or so during the coronavirus? And what is the situation currently in, in, um, in Hudaida? There were many talks about the many discussions uh, a couple of 
years ago and, and in the last year as well regarding the, the importance of food aid when it comes to the inflow of humanitarian aid. What is the situation now on the ground? Um, Julia, can we start with you? Mm. Uh, I think uh, the case of Yemen essentially uh, falls into the global global trends uh, when it comes to humanitarian aid provision regarding Corona. This is not surprising or uh, due to the Corona pandemic. This is not surprising to anyone that uh, aid has been humanitarian aid has been on a lower level. Um, also, essentially, now Yemen has received uh, some vaccines uh, thanks to this COVAX scheme. Uh, but it is very difficult to imagine that how is this going to be distributed when, in fact, most of the hospitals has been either bombed by the Saudi coalition or by the Houthis. So the healthcare facilities are uh, almost non-existent and non-functioning. Uh, so humanitarian aid uh, is less and less in Yemen. Uh, the last time when I looked at it, the peak was in 2018. Uh, now, when we are talking about this, always saddens me a little bit to be a little personal when we are talking about the wor world's worst humanitarian crisis because after a while no one just pays attention to this because uh, part of the reason of this um, media framing uh, there is truth to these incredible and incomprehensible humanitarian conditions there uh, these humanitarian organizations are also driven by uh, the need to secure funding so there is an interest uh, in basically maintaining uh, this uh, these horrible images which cannot translate into the uh, individual's daily life where they do not understand it um, and uh, the latter part, uh, what was the second part of this question? Because I forgot it. <laughs> it was a complex one. So basically the situation of Hudaida, uh, yes. because there were many discussions about that previously. I'm, I'm going to uh, hand over it mostly to Faria, but what I can uh, say is that uh, we should remember that at the end of 2018, something very promising at the international community thought that something very promising was happening with uh, the um, ceasefire agreement over Hodeida. Now, uh, the UN mission uh, to oversee this agreement is basically ceased to exist. And then now uh, approximately uh, 12 people uh, are stationed in this mission. Uh, and also the current mandate of that mission is going to end in two months. Uh, and who knows what's going to happen. There was a handover of the port to the local security forces which are the Houthis so that wasn't really accepted by anyone and in fact uh, one of the uh, more geostrategic aims uh, of the coalition forces whether it's uh, the Saudis or UAE has been to find alternative uh, routes for import and export uh, other than Hodeida, which is still under Houthi control. What's going on there on a daily basis uh, I'm sure that Faria can tell more about that. Thank you. Yes, uh, with the first question first about um, the aid, I wanted to add a few points into that. One is obviously, in addition to what Julia said, we have a cut of funding, we have all of that, but we, we also have two points I wanted to make clear is we have a problem in aid, how also aid is delivered and how would aid industry by itself, by INGOs have been being conducted in Yemen and somewhere else in the world. And Yemen has also been the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, but it is also the worst humanitarian response in the world. Over the five years that have happened, INGOs, including the United Nations, have compromised the integrity of humanitarian aid and the principles for the sake of access, so they don't lose donors. And they ended up losing both. Because compromising, especially with the Houthis, as we have seen from a lot of the reports internationally and from a report I know is coming from Sana'a Center soon, is how this have led into an entire problematic fundamental accountability, but also delivery and efficiency problems of in the ground. That's one thing important to say. The aid industry, the fault of INGOs compromising have been bad and have been something effective. The other point I wanted to make is also from the donors and is having the aid by itself has been uh, as a weapon and as a lobbyist as every other thing. 
it's a surreal that the biggest four donors for Yemen are US, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and United Kingdom, the four biggest investors in war in Yemen. So this has looked into aid whenever there was a laundry or a dirty laundry needed to be done. It's held the aid conference, even if this aid conference is 2% of the overheads of this arm deal between the West and this country, even if it is nothing compared to what we lost as a country from the siege of importing and exporting, when you think about it. When you look even a bit further, you go to Dubai, you find it uh, the, the biggest logistical hub right now from an, uh, 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 for an aid organization in the region, actually, even for organizations very activistic like MSF. So these countries, in addition into launching wars in the region, they have a place their economies and their selves to benefit from these wars. And even if that beneficial or a framework takes uh, an aid framework, you see that in many ways. And I think that's an issue, not just in Yemen, but also in other parts um, of the region. That's just for the first question. Quickly on the second one, I know we are running out of time. Hudaida, to my knowledge, is a, a, a very stable right now at the front lines. There isn't, there's a clashes here and there, but since the Stockholm agreement was signed, nothing really fundamentally changed in that front line. It's still kind of more or less the same. You have things moved and things back forth. Um, there isn't much a change there. Similarly, the fuel import that's going with Hudaida, uh, you hear a lot of reports and organizations uh, saying that there is a shortage of fuel via Hudaida. I do not believe that's true. The fuel shortages actually, according to Sana'a Center studies and research, are Houthi made internally so that they control and manipulate the price of fuels inside Yemen rather than because there isn't fuel getting into the country. We have done some work into that. So yes, it is also a, a place where the Houthis have held hostage as much as they can do over the last uh, three or four years. Over to you and thank you. Thank you. Uh, lastly, I, I have an easy question for you. I will combine two questions actually. Uh, so what um, tools does the US have to put pressure on the Houthis to push them towards the peace process? Uh, and Secondly, what is the solutions? What are the solutions to end the war in Yemen? <laughs> if you can answer that in two minutes, that would be that that would be perfect. Now I'm like uh, as a as a conclusive part, let me rephrase the second question. So basically, what are the necessary next steps which you can see which has to be done either from the uh, American side or the side of any other actors? Yulia, can we start with you? So I think these are the world's most difficult uh, questions, uh, but uh, this is uh, an opportunity to uh, end it nicely, I guess. Um, so I think uh, fundamental, uh, the first fundamental step uh, to agree on, uh, and almost everyone agrees on this, uh, except for the Houthis as of yet, is to have a nationwide ceasefire, uh, to have something that would um, make political talks conducive, uh, and then take it on from there. Uh, because if the fighting, at least for a little bit, is over, even without a political settlement, that would give some respite to the population and that would hold uh, the further damage uh, made to the country, at least for a little while. So I think first a ceasefire, a nationwide ceasefire, uh, and then simultaneously to this, this would happen at the national level in Yemen, simultaneously to this, a new UN resolution that needs to guide the subsequent peace talks. But that new UN resolution shouldn't reflect uh, UN Security Council members' wishes on what should happen in Yemen, uh, but should integrate, uh, as I do believe that the National Dialogue Conference was fundamentally a good idea in Yemen. Uh, it was basically sidelined uh, um, side by uh, both the Houthis and that time Hirak movement. But I do think that locals uh, aspirations and needs has to be taken into account in any type of political uh, resolution that will come to Yemen, which we haven't really seen so far happening. Uh, and whether there, what are the prospects of this? I'm going to be pessimistic uh, to, to be fair. Uh, I, see, I don't really see uh, a lot of positive developments. Uh, I'm not sure that how sustained the US attention on Yemen will be over time because 
presidents usually tend to make more promises uh, early on in their election, especially before their elections. Whether this will be interesting in one or two years, who knows? Uh, and if the current situation, as Faria described earlier, this uh, giving a little support, but not enough uh, to essentially um, have an overwhelming military solution to the conflict, then this stalemate uh, will just drag on forever. Uh, so let's start by a nationwide ceasefire. This is what this is what I would conclude with. And thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Farah. Difficult to add after Julia, but one just line is: I think the problem with Yemen is there hasn't there hasn't been investment in peace. You know, that's I think is a major problem to remember, whether from the UN or the US or Europe or the West or the region or international frameworks. And that's important to remember is to have that investment and to have that political push. And when that level happens, I don't think that we don't have a solution. So we will be able to figure things out. But that most basic prerequisite uh, decision to invest in peace in Yemen needs to be made. And it needs to be made on all levels, regionally, internationally, and obviously Western-wise. Over and thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to conclude the discussion on such a pessimistic note. Uh, if it were up to me, I, we would continue this conversation for hours because there are so uh, many other topics uh, to discuss. But thank you very much, Yulia Palik and Farea Muslimi, uh, to share your ideas. I really enjoyed the discussion, and I think that both me and my audience will learn a lot uh, from your expertise. Uh, thank you very much also for listening to our conversation. You can rewatch this discussion on YouTube many times and please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and all the other uh, platforms. I don't think that we have a TikTok, but hopefully that will happen <laughs> sometimes in the future. So thank you very much and um, have a nice day. <laughs>